start now. So welcome everyone to our March talk. So this is the Global Diabetes Journal Club. <clears throat> we are very happy to have you and we are very happy that Ling accepted to, to present today. So Ling is based at the University of Leicester and should be presenting her meta-analysis published in Diabetes Care on investigating causality between type 2 diabetes and cancer and trying to account for unmeasured confounding. So thank you once more. And we look forward to hearing from you, Ling. Take it over. Thank you, Camilla. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me to um, uh, this Juno Club. Um, and as I said before, this is a very good platform for uh, everyone to share and discuss their own research in the area of diabetes. So um, as Camille said, I'm currently based in University of Leicester. I'm a research associate in epidemiology and I'm, I'm interested in um, use different statistical methods to uh, investigate risk or prognosis of different cardiometabolic disease and cancer using uh, electronic health records and disease registry. So if anybody have the same research comment, do uh, send me an email and then possibly we can build a project together. And so today I'm going to talk about a paper we have just published last year but I've been, I've been working on this probably two or three years to uh, investigate the causality between type 2 diabetes and cancer incidence mortality using meta-analysis with bias analysis, um, accounting for uh, unmeasured confounding. So this, this bias analysis is developed by Professor Van der Waal and Dr. Martha in, I believe, in Harvard University now. Um, uh, which I will explain later in detail. But I hope this talk uh, is not just about sharing this method. I hope it can be used more, of course, in observational study or meta-analysis. Or um, I hope we can have an interesting discussion about the uh, causal inference from different perspectives. Um, okay. Okay. It so a big question here, does diabetes causes, does diabetes cause cancer? I guess this is a very, uh, a question many people want to understand. Uh, conventionally, diabetes is a known cause for many cardiovascular disease and it is also reflected in the guidance and randomized control trials, which usually the, the, uh, the end of point for many, uh, glucose lowering medication will be cardiovascular disease. Um, but as for cancer, not, not much have been done in RCT, I'm afraid. Um, and why, why would we interest in that? I think it's mainly because diabetes represent a vulnerable group and it is possible we can identify a high risk population, we can do early intervention, early detection, and possibly screen, screening program. Um, if continued research going on in people specifically with diabetes and cancer, it is possible we can develop stratified treatment in this group as well. So um, though it's not as highly uh, profile as cardiovascular disease, but um, there are many people interested in this topic, I have to say. So as of today, there are 28,000 publications related to diabetes and cancer, and more than 700 of them are meta-analysis. So um, we don't know. We don't know if diabetes causes cancer or not, but many people are interested in that. And of course, it will include lots of uh, biology study as well in, in this. So I just assume everyone understands a bit of background of diabetes and the possible mechanisms of why diabetes may cause cancer. So I will skip that part, but focus on epidemiology part. So um, how can we establish uh, causation or causal inference? Um, 
we we often say uh, in the analysis, uh, correlation does not imply causation, but in in many uh, observational study, we we often report association. Um, can we say association imply causation? Probably not, um, because in this famous diagram, when we explore the relationship between exposure and outcome, there are many factors might confound this relationship. And in observational study, of course, apart from confounding, there are many other bias. Uh, like information bias, recall bias, um, uh, misclassification, uh, everything sort of that. But confounding, I think, is the uh, most interesting part for statistician because all other bias might have been dealt with at the study design um, stage. So this confounding part is what uh, statistician can have fun with it, let's say, in that way. Um, so what, what is confounding? Um, I think, I guess that's a question we're being asked many times for many epidemiologists. So I, here I will quote what Professor Vanderwell, who, uh, who has established the framework of this bias analysis. So he says the uh, confounding factor is a factor uh, causally linked to exposure or outcome or both. So when we're looking for adjust, adjustment for confounding, we would need to adjust for these three types of um, factors related to exposure, outcome, or both. So there are many ways to, um, to establish causation. I think the gold standard would be randomized control trials. But in this case, for this particular question, diabetes and cancer, we could not uh, randomize people to have diabetes or not to have diabetes. Um, so even though in the observational study, they have been um, very popular uh, methodology called uh, Mendelian randomization, I'm sure there are experts here in genetic epidemiology with that. So, but given the limited data so far we have, so it is not always feasible, but it's, I, I'm just saying it's a way to investigate the uh, causal inference within this topic. What is the possible other ways to answer this question? So um, given the large amount of existing literature looking at the association between diabetes and cancer, and it is possible we can use this bias analysis to uh, address the potential causality between diabetes and cancer using existing data. So I have um, summarized a little bit of what it would do. So for bias analysis, they have developed, um, I think now they have added a bit more, but this is a package in R uh, called E-value. I think of, of when I did the analysis for this study, they can only account for a measured confounding, um, which didn't take into account other bias, for example, selection bias in the observational study. But I believe they're developing the methods to add this in. So I'll focus on what, at that time, what to have done with this package, which is focusing on, on measured confounding. I wouldn't go to detail about the um, statistical theory behind that, but if you're interested, you can look into the package and also the, uh, related to reference of this package. So what it does, it assess the, uh, to extend a measured confounding would have to affect both exposure and outcome in order to uh, um, say the observed association between exposure and outcome to be attributable solely to confounding. In this case, we see unmeasured confounding because in the meta-analysis, the, the original study have adjusted for some confoundings. So in simple languages, to have a 
estimate of how large the effect of confounding would have to be to explain away the observed effect. And another thing they can do is to estimate the proportion of meaningful effect size with a correcting for pre pre specified unmeasured confounding. So there are four parameters here to keep it simple. First is the observed association. In this case, will be the hazard ratio or relative risk, whatever we have derived from either observational studies or meta analysis. Second is the meaningful effect size, which you believe the causal association causal association should be, for example, diabetes and lung cancer, which what, what kind of, what level of effect size you believe should be 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Um, and then the third parameter is unmeasured confounding. So how strong the unmeasured confounding should be to explain away the observed, uh, observe, observed association. And the force is the proportion of meaningful effect size, which we have assumed and accounting for this unmeasured confounding. So there are many number here, but later I'll give you a example what I have did in the study. And sorry, I forgot to put this reference earlier. So this is the main reference I have looking for. If anyone interested, you can have a look. Um, so for the first step, as I said before, it will be a standard meta-analysis like any meta-analysis you have you've done. So we will get a uh, relative risk pulled from the uh, observational study. Um, so it is a fixed number. You could not change that. This is what you observed. And then we have a relative risk B which is the confounding you assume associate with causally associate with exposure and outcome. Um, I believe in the E value, the maximum they can measure is ranged from one to four. But in terms of the confounding, it's quite a large number. It's, it's unlikely you can find a confounding factor. Um, I think even larger than two is quite a quite, uh, large number. So. Um, but you can you can have various assumptions here. And relative risk C is the true effect you believe it should be between diabetes and cancer. And because this this study of uh, has included many cancer sites, so I couldn't um, assign a number for this site is different. So we explore a quite wide range of possible uh combination so for true risk factor we believe could range from 0 0.5 to 2 um because there's prostate cancer i don't know how many people know about diabetes and cancer prostate cancer is known um diabetes is a decree uh associated with decreased risk of prostate cancer in many studies so here i also assumed it is possible diabetes would decrease the risk of cancer. So, um, and then we can estimate with, and then there's the proportion of a true effect size. So with three out of four parameters available, you can, you can measure many uh, possibilities to establish causation. So this is the um, diagram, I believe, um it's useful it's the same as the before the uh the diagram of exposure and outcome so here we looked into as i said before we have relative risk a which is fixed and observed effect and then we we assume the relative risk b unmeasured confounding range from one to four and then we assume the the true effects has ranged from 0 0.5 to 2. So there are lots of assumptions here because this is a purely um, statistical assumption based on what we know about this topic. Um, and then this is the way just I, how, how do I plot these results? So here the x 
axis he on the left uh, on the left figure uh, x axis is the confounding strength uh, ranged from one to four and then the y axis here is the proportion of the true effect size which we have assumed a true effect size for each cancer sites and then the the lines is the um the dam is the true effect size the y axis the pro proportion and then for each cancer site we will have one figure for each so i will give you example later to uh to illustrate what if what this figure means so this is uh, just uh, like i said before is a standard um meta-analysis uh, study selection so we started from because this topic it was so so big there are thousands of hundreds of thousands of paper have been published in this era so instead of going through every um and possible turns we we uh pull out a big um systematic review it's called umbrella review published in bmj in 2013 and uh, they have included most meta-analysis in this topic so we search the new study from from 2013 to 2019 and then we look into the study have been included in the bmj paper so um so far it's quite uh, standard for any um, meta-analysis so we have at the end we have included 151 cohorts it is possible there are some study reported several cohorts in one paper and they have individual cohort level individual effect size so it gave us the possibility to explore that so we have included 151 cohorts with 32 million population and let's talk about study selection and then uh, again, because of the large number of a uh, study have been included, we could not put the uh, baseline characteristics for each study in the MEM manuscript. So instead, we put in the supplement. If anyone interested in that, um, will be in the table. Instead, in the MEM paper, we have reported the cohort level or outcome level information about the population, the outcome. And the confounding adjusted, of course, is the essential part for for this bias analysis. So, um, because we have included many cancer sites, it's quite difficult to see uh, which confounding factor is generic for uh, diabetes and cancer. So, at the end, we decided age and sex as the main confounding, and then BMI as the second important fund confounding so as you can see from here for almost for all study of adjust for age and sex which is expected and then about half let's say more than half or less than 50 percent have adjust for bmi of course for other factors is important like smoking is non uh, cause of uh, cancer many cancers and we try to quantify this proportion as well. So the less uh, adjust for smoking and even less for alcohol. I assume for alcohol, the collection will be quite difficult because you need a, a diet measure. And then uh, of course, there are some study would adjust for other factors. For example, for female cancers, the uh, reproductive history might be important. So we just classify them as others. So most of the study have tried to adjust for confounding, but for BMI in particular, it's only about the 15%, 50%. So this is the uh, main results of a, over meta-analysis. So for most um, meta-analysis, we can stop here to draw a conclusion and diabetes have uh, associated with a decreased risk of prostate cancer with about a, a relative risk of 0.83, but have an increased risk from breast cancer to liver cancer instance, and also have increased risk of pancreatic cancer. So if you can uh, see here from, this is I, sorry, this figure is I rounded, I didn't, 
make it more <laughs> readable. But here I is the heterogeneity of the um, of each meta analysis. As you can see here, is for most the study is quite high across study is quite different. And here as well, the bias analysis can uh, can help. Um, so what we did is we used the relative risk we drew from here, and then the information of heterogeneity, and then put this number in the e-value package, used in the e-value package to calculate these results. As I said before, we assumed a measure confounding from one to four, and then the, for, for the two risk factor, we assume from 0 0.5 to, to two, but because of the limit of the, the, the figure can present. So we only select some, some numbers here, but all other results are put on a GitHub if anyone interested in that. So, um, and so here I made a very strong assumption uh, about the unmeasured confounding, just to give an idea how um, this causality thing looks like. So I assumed the unmeasured confounding is 1.5 is significant, is, is relevant for this association between diabetes and cancer. And for the proportion of the true effect size, again, I make a strong assumption, 70%, I believe is relevant. But of course you can, you can have your own uh, interpretation. Um, so this number and for, for the true effect size, I believe minimum 10% of risk increase or decrease. Um, so in this case, I will put relative risk to, re to relative risk of 1.1 for increased risk or 0 0.9 for decreased risk. So here, if I use 70% uh, of the y-axis and then 1.5 of the uh, x-axis, for a measure confounding and then 70% for a uh, proportion of the true effect size. And then it gives us a figure, if more lines, a green zoom here, sorry, a green zoom here. If more lines fall into this green zoom, that means the, the association between um, diabetes and cancer more likely to be causal. So uh, basically if they've, is if the lines are more top or right or right hand side, it's it's more likely to be causal. So as you can see, it's very consistent with the meta analysis before. If I can go back here, so the larger the relative risk it should be, it need more a measure confounding to explain away the association, which is expected, of course. But for many cancer sites here. Uh, there are not much lands fall into that. So just remember this 1.0 is a reference here. Not many lands have been here for many cancer sites not to be following this, uh, this green zone, which I believe I assumed is causal. So for, for some cancer sites, for example, from liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, endometrial cancer, gallbladder, start to have some uh, two effect sites fall into this line. So for this figure, because the, the, um, the information is already a lot, there's also the, the um, uncertainty uh, problem, confidence interval, but because the figure already very busy, so we didn't put into here, we just select some, we believe is the significant points to present a confidence interval. Again, this is the proportion of the study which we believe is unconfounded association, assuming a measure confounding is 1.5. And then we present two, two risk factor, which is 10% and 30% increase or decrease risk. So it means the relative risk either is 1.1, 1.3, or 0 0.9, or 0 0.7. So here, it's very consistent with what we, be, we uh, have seen before. For 10% increased risk for liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, endometrium, gallbladder, is almost nearly 100%, more than 90%. 
So we can safely to say that diabetes minimum will increase 10% of risk of this cancer. But for others, up to here, the confidence interval is very wide. I guess it's because the, the heterogeneity is so high. This, they cannot calculate the, they can, the, the, uh, the confidence interval is very wide. This, the uncertainty is wide. But when we increase to increase to 30%, which means the true effect size is 1.3 or, or 0 0.7, for most of the size here, it's almost a zero. So it's very unlikely for diabetes will have, oops, sorry, oops. Uh, diabetes have more than 30% of increased risk for these cancer sites. But for liver cancer and pancreatic cancer, it's still quite strong uh, proportions here. But of course, for mortality, pancreatic cancer here, the confidence interval is very wide. So, um, I, and then I summarize a table here. Uh, I didn't put this in the manuscript of submission because I, at, that, at the beginning, I believe people are looking for a definitive answer for causality um, for any question research, uh, basically for any research question, basically. So people would want to know, interesting to know, uh, diabetes will cause cancer. But when I look back these uh, results from the figures or the, the uncertainty, what I've got is so causality is not a definitive thing, is a um, probability thing. So we can see prob diabetes will probably cause uh, liver cancer, but we, we don't know, first we don't know the true effect size or we don't know, um, even we don't know it's true. So I summarized this table, but I want to give you an idea what I believe my assumption is. So I want to anyone, if anyone have seen these results, would you draw the same conclusion as me? Because from different background, people may have different interpretation of the results. I think that's where the causality should be in. Um, it's not a definitive answer. It's, it's, a, um, it's not black and white, but it's, it depends on what you believe it is. And then the research question can answer what do you believe is yes or no, but it's never, we cannot find the truth. Um, at the end, I want to share with you, remind ourselves this Blatford here criteria for causal inference in uh, particular in um, observational study. So of course, the first is how strong the effect size. So um, as we can see earlier, they, if the meta-analysis have a stronger effect size, it's likely the, the association is causal and consistency, or we call it uh, reproducibility. Again, uh, meta-analysis is a way to check back the reference before what they have done, and is a consistent what, what have been repeatedly reported. And all others, I won't go into detail, but just, just want to remind ourselves in the epidemiology what, what it could be, and uh, does all the causal inference fit all this criteria? Um, at the end, I want to share a philosophy. Um, I don't know many people, if many people know this person. So um, this is in German, but I would translate, try to translate. To, so no, there's no facts, only interpretation. So I think it also applies to when we try to use statistical methods to inference causality. So um, it all depends on what you believe in and what you can test with the statistical methods. So that will be the end of my presentation. If anyone have any questions. Thank you very much, Suping. I think this was an amazing presentation. Thank you. I'm a big fan of, I'm really a big fan of fundamentals of AP. So all these reminders, putting your study in context, I mean, it's really just a pleasure for me. So thank you. Yeah, so I think the presentation was really clear. And your paper was so, 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 I mean, interesting, especially in these times of cancer and, uh, and diabetes and all these um, similar risk factors. So it's really important to, to, to understand what causes what and if there is any causality at all. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with that, I'm willing to open the floor. If you have any questions or comments, just feel free to unmute yourself and uh, and have a go. So if not, Lauren has posted a comment here, which I may ask. So Lauren asks, what are the mechanisms proposed for the link between diabetes, both type one and type two, and degrees risk of prostate cancer? So um, just for anyone, if uh, no one have studied or read any paper in this area, so recognized mechanism would be um, um, hyperinsulinemia and hypoglycemia, I believe. And also again to what is the definition of diabetes because currently the diagnosis of diabetes is based on uh, HbA1c or glucose level. So um, there are studies investigating the glucose level and, um, and, and cancer, and there are some positive outcomes, uh, consistent outcome, that's not positive, consistent, consistent outcomes have uh, found this. Uh, another, another one is insulin resistance, which they believe is quite common in many chronic disease. But I would say it's all very generic because you can see insulin resistance increase many dis- the risk of many disease and being let's say confirmed. So um, very interestingly, because I think it's another way compare in comparison to the another methods uh, which I mentioned earlier, Mendeling randomization. That few study have done uh, so far in this topic. So. Um, they haven't found any link between this, the diabetes, but in this case, I believe the genetic uh, definition of diabetes will be high risk of um, hyperglycemia. Um, but they defined the, um, the association between uh, insulin resistance, the, the genetic variants related to insulin resistance and, and cancer. So, I think it all depends on what is the um, definition of diabetes. There's another aspect which is important in diabetes is glucose control. There have been many new drugs been using in diabetes. We don't know if any of them would have impact on the cancer risk. I mean, there's some study have been assessed the um, um, Sulfonylureas and insulin use uh, might increase risk, but we don't know because it, when it comes to drug study, it's very complicated. So um, yeah, so basically, biological mechanism would be uh, hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance. I think it's mainly this is three or chronic in- inflammation, which is very often mentioned in many chronic disease. Um, also, all this, all this have been linked to obesity as well, which is another key confounding, we believe, in the diabetes and cancer. Thank you very much. That's very clear. <clears throat> so Tini has posted a link to talks that concern cancer and diabetes. So if you are interested, please do, do check out the link and, and your future presentations. <clears throat> so is there any other question? If not, I'm happy to go myself. So I have this burning question since that I read the paper because I'm really a big fan of these fundamentals of eating. So your paper focused um, on on measured confounding and Mm -hmm. actually trying to make an inference about causality. Mm -hmm. But then I think that although we all agree that unmeasured confounding is a problem in observational studies, we also yes. do agree that residual confounding is a greater threat. I think that's my opinion. It's a greater threat to the validity of observational studies because unmeasured, I mean, omission of the variable completely from the study. Yeah. But then residual arises from these imprecise measurements of variables. And then you talked about adiposity in your introduction as being really one of these risk factors that would affect diabetes and and, and cancer, and that could be a real candidate for this confounding. Mm-hmm. But then many, many studies, in many observational studies tend to use BMI to account for mm-hmm. adiposity, and we know that that's a very poor proxy for adiposity. You yes. may want to go for 
I don't know, BIA or DEXA, which is quite difficult for large observational studies. Mm -hmm. So my concern is, yeah, maybe unmeasured confounding has been addressed, but what do we do about this residual confounding, which arises from this measurement of BMI, uh, of adiposity using BMI, for example, or physical mm -hmm. activity using self-reports. And so mm -hmm. did you account for that? And can we still argue that because of residual confounding, we cannot directly leave from, from, from uh -huh. your study to causality? I will talk about possible, possible association still. Uh -huh. so, uh, okay, so I'll start. I, I think I think this question has two major parts. First is about these methods. So uh, when when we see a measure confounding in in so this e value package can be applied in observational study as well as meta analysis. If you are interested in uh, using observational study, you can have a look at the R package. So when we don't have information, for example, like you mentioned related to other than BMI, um, and like you said, in large cohort, it takes lots of human resources and money to measure some uh, factors. So this a measure confounding package, do you account for that? So, um, so but it, it makes very strong assumption how strong it is. So you wouldn't know the exact relationship be between them, but it's just like a, a lump sum, let's say in that way, lump sum uh, assumption. Um, I believe this is a measure confounding in this study or in this particular topic. Um, um, I'm not an expert in the statistical theory behind this package, but if anyone interested can look back the paper. But as far as I understand, uh, a measure confounding regard to uh, whatever not measured in the study, uh, not accounted for in the study, will be uh, assumed in this in this calculation. Let put in that way. Back to your question about what what do we do with this? I guess we have to uh, sacrifice one of the two when we when we uh, design a study because. A perfect study costs a lot, and we try to make it visible as as visible as possible. I think there are two ways currently in the epidemiology in any topic. Actually, there are two ways where we have large cohorts. Uh, they try to measure as many factors as possible. For example, um, biobank, which we know is a very large cohort, they have information about dietary lifestyle. They also add information about uh, genetic, uh, biological information. So, um, in this last large core study, we can possibly adjust for more confounding factor um, for many diseases because they have been linked to a uh, uh, hospital as well to find out the endpoint. So there's another way is which I'm interested in to use electronic health records data, um, which is when we construct epidemiology study from electronic health records, and then there are less information about lifestyle, dietary, this kind of uh, norm risk factor for many disease, but they have information about disease, disease history, uh, drug use and lab test and everything. So I guess from these two type of study, we can we have to sacrifice something in, in one type and then or in another type. So but there are also the uh, the focus for different for this classic cohort as well as um, um, uh, studies from uh, electronic health records. I guess what we can do is make use of what we have and make sure the methodology is sound and we can try our best to uh, info causality from what we have. This, this is what I would say, yeah. Thank you, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to, uh, want to follow up on Camille's question there because yes, this bias analysis, there is a lot of assumptions but I will say, I think I really appreciate that you actually did it 
not many studies do this. And I think it gives us at least some sort of idea about how much yeah, confounding there would have to be to explain away the results that we observe, right? And you, you did that in a really nice way, including a lot of studies as well. So mm -hmm. I guess you can, at least we can say that there is some sort of evidence for some of these uh, cancers being uh, related to, to diabetes risk. And I think that's a good starting point. I was yes. wondering because as Camille said, yes, this is a lot of focus on confounding. That's, and I think that I'd agree that's a big thing, but it's not the only thing. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you also looked into what about the quality of the studies that you included? Because mm -hmm. so are there some, like if some studies that addressed or you are more confident in had like a, like a, a better overall, I guess, yeah, quality mm -hmm. or more certainty of, of the evidence. So, so you mm -hmm. could say, okay, so maybe these studies, they also took into account selection bias and information bias to a mm -hmm. better extent than the other ones, right? So we could be maybe mm -hmm. more certain, even more certain that, that these were good studies. So how did you look into that? That's my question. Yeah, so um, that's a very good question, I have to say, and that is exactly one of the questions we received from peer review. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so as I said before, I think this group in uh, Harvard, they have been developing new methods to look into the uh, selection bias or collateral bias, whatever you call it, um, to uh, extend the... the um, uses of this package. But back to my paper, what I have done is um, I have conducted a sensitivity analysis to look into the papers with good quality. We believe it's good quality assessed by uh, NOS. So basically we have done another analysis using this study only. Um, so what we found also, the results are available in the supplement if anyone is interested. So, um, so what we found is largely consistent with what we report in the main manuscript. But the key thing is when we have less number of study, the confidence interval becomes wider. So I think that is expected as well. But I guess in you, if if you use the in the observational study. I don't think you will have this problem. Uh, again, just back to a measure confounding is important, but there are other uh, bias like we discussed many times in observational study. Um, the key thing is at the beginning of designing the study, uh, we need to bear in mind this, this potential bias. And then at the implementation of the study, we can try our best to account for minimize this bias. But we, we will never be able to eliminate, but we can try our best to minimize, yeah. Thank you, Sophie. Any further questions? <clears throat> yes, I, I do have one. Uh, thank you, Sophie, for a very interesting and nice presentation. Um, very uh, quite advanced uh, methodological epi uh, methods you are uh, using. I'm also surprised about it. Um, I wanted to ask you how often did you identify variables to diabetes treatment control duration in the cohort studies that you uh, selected? Because that's one of the, the key factors uh, in this association. Mm -hmm. So I, I think this question will be a bit uh, different to um, when I look solely into the population with diabetes, because in, in the study I have included the reference group will be people without diabetes. So it's unlikely you would adjust for the treatment in this case, because for all um, non-diabetes reference group will be default is non-treatment to to diabetes at all. But um, recently I'm doing a study within diabetes only. So it's looking at the, uh, the glycemic control and, and cancer progression in people with 
cancer and diabetes. In that case, I believe the, the uh, treatment of diabetes is very relevant. And um, I think there are some studies have been published to look into the risk of cancer in people with diabetes and then comparing different type of drug. Uh, they've done some post-hot analysis in some large trial like our court. If I remember correctly, there's paper in Diabetologia, I think, uh, looking at the different um, types of uh, treatment. But I have to say, I'm not an expert in this area. So uh, I only read papers from what I've written in the paper. So it's insulin and supraneural have been repeatedly report associated with higher risk of of cancer, but I, I think that's, that could be because usually, for example, insulin at the end, it will be used at the later stage of diabetes. These people would have been in diabetes for quite a long time, and it is likely you will capture cancer instance at later stage. So I, um, you could say it uh, in mortal time bias, which have been investigated a lot in a uh, drug study related to diabetes. Uh, I think I think there's a professor in Sweden, Sam Swissa. I don't know if anyone knows that. So she has done a lot of um, study on the drug study and on, on, on drug study methodology, epidemiology methodology related to this drug issue in any outcome in people with diabetes. So. Um, I, I don't think I've answered your question, but to just share what I know and um, and hopefully if anyone had more to add, I don't know if anyone an expert in treatment of diabetes. I had a quick question to follow up. So one term that you mentioned that some viewers might not know or be so familiar with is Mendelian randomization. So could you talk a little bit about that? And if you're doing any work related to that or maybe interested in the future? Uh, I'm not an expert. I um, I believe you are. Are you, or I, I remember wrong, I don't know. So uh, I'm not an expert in Mendelian randomization, but uh, as far as I understand, it look into the uh, genetic variants related to uh, different, let's say, different aspect of diabetes, and then um, link to the outcome. In this case, would be cancer instance or mortality. Uh, I believe now Biobank is available to possibly to investigate this. Um, um, question. And from what I know from the literature, uh, most uh, groups uh, published in this area will be from Japan. I believe they have quite a lot of data related to genetic, um, just in general, they have more. And then America, and the sun groups are doing uh, very similar. So at the time I was reading up the paper, there are only three or four um, Mendelian randomization study in this topic. So if anyone in this area, I think it's definitely worth to look into. But it's personally, I've not, I've not done anything with that at all. I, it's not in my plan, recent, in my recent plan, so yeah. If you want to add anything, I, I think if, I don't know if you are, if you are the, I, I believe you are in uh, genetic epidemiology, isn't it? I study genetic epidemiology, but I've never used Mendelian randomization. So yeah, basically there's big assumptions that you have to make and you need mm -hmm. to have a sufficient sample size of people. So I, I've seen studies, uh, for example, maybe in like UK Biobank, looking at relationship between a couple traits, as you said, but thanks for giving the summary. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm sorry, I cannot comment on this anymore. I really, 
don't know a lot about this. This is just a method I'm aware of could be useful. And of course, like Rowan mentioned, there are lots of criticism in uh, related to this method. Um, and uh, like, again, strong assumptions and not necessarily fulfilling any study design. Thank you very much, Supin. Anyone has any other question? I think we can take two more questions or so. I just wanted so, to highlight that you're, yeah. that you're planning to run similar studies using the health, electronic health records and uh, registers. So the main advantage of using uh, registers is that uh, you have uh, long follow-ups, mm -hmm. so the people in your cohorts will will be able to develop both outcomes. Because I guess in many of the cohorts that you included, the number of cases were very small, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why you get the the big uh, confidence intervals. But mm -hmm. with the with the electronic health records, you will uh, get the automatically recorded uh, patient. Mm -hmm information and then you will have to follow up it's just a matter of uh, wait <laughs> long enough yeah, yeah. i guess now recent years this this the, the the idea of big data being very popular and um has been applied in many studies in the area of diabetes so but i believe for the classic cohort they have their own advantage as well like biobank they have collect many inform uh variables related to uh, lifestyle diet um, which is not available in in most electronic health records and also a link to the electronic health records so i i think i think a both both type of study have their own advantage and disadvantage Thank you. So I think I had a last question. I mean, it could be a very naive question for me, but when reading the paper, I noticed that you didn't have any pre-specified cancer, specific cancer. And mm -hmm. so you mentioned that you included the, you included cancers that were reported in more than 10 studies. So, I mean, I wondered if that's a standard in meta-analysis or by using such an approach, you could simply be highlighting a problem of publication bias where mm -hmm. positive associations with cancer tend to be published and then these other cancers that don't show any association with diabetes are, mm -hmm. are not reported. So I just want that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, again, I think like uh, we have discussed earlier, in one study, we have to sacrifice something. So because I, we have collected lots of information from this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, but because the first, because of the time uh, consumed in the analysis and organize everything, uh, it is possible I have missed the outcome less than 10 study uh, could be important. And because they didn't find uh, positive association and then they decided to not to publish it but in my paper I try to make it uh, doable and uh, give as much I try to make a balance between doable and give much information as possible so um, there's no any scientific rationale behind that I decided to go go for more than 10 it's just because of the, the management of the workload and I, we did look into the publication bias for each meta-analysis, uh, like you said, because there are many, uh, for most outcomes, they've been reported in more than 10 courses. So we did not find much publication bias in this study, in this outcomes. But I'm not sure for other outcomes have not included in the analysis, they could be. And um, I think it requires more, um, specific question in terms of which type of cancer and um, we can look into that. So definitely more, more research and more work 
need to be done in this area. Yeah. Thank you. Can I, can, can, I, can I just have a like a final final question to round off the, sure, the discussion? Daniel. So, <laughs> so this is yeah, this was a really impressive paper, and but Thank I you. but my really my my question is so, what do what is kind of your main takeaway from this paper? If you should kind of try to try to summarize it in some way, like. So, um, I think I think what I have learned from this study is, uh, like I mentioned earlier causality is not black and white is not yes or no it's it's about probability so um and because the the choose the out there we we are not able to collect information we wanted to investigate this study all we can do is make a judgment based on what we know and then we can safely say or likely to say that probably there's causation between these two so and also I think I will be careful in the future study try not to make a definitive uh, conclusion say this drug this disease or this factor definitely increase the risk of this disease so I think I think um for me, it's a uh, summarize of uh, accumulative evidence of diabetes and cancer, and we did find something. But I think that's not the most important thing for me personally. It will add a bit of extra value for the for this area, but for me personally, it's about the the acknowledgement of the the um, the causality is not always definitive. Thank you very much, Suping. I think this was a wonderful presentation. Like this paper has just piqued my interest so much and <clears throat> I'm very happy that you really accepted to present. You can see you had so many questions because of the interest that it really, that it really generated. So thank you once more. So this was recorded and the video